Hello everyone, I'm Andrew, and before we go full steam ahead into 2018, we're gonna take one last look back at the year in film. Kaya and Dev have already tackled the best and worst movies of 2017, shout outs to Geostorm. So for my video, I want to explore some of last year's most outstanding special effects. Today's effects are so convincing that half the time we don't even realize that they're actually there. I mean, I didn't walk away from Logan thinking, man, they did a great job inserting a completely digital Hugh Jackman into that car chase, but I was blown away when I realized just how much of that gritty, bare bones movie was rendered on a computer. Modern CGI is so ubiquitous that it's hard to stand out from the pack, no matter how many millions of polygons you throw at any given problem. But last year had some of the most exciting, innovative, and awesome VFX work we've ever seen. Which is why we're counting down the best special effects of 2017. When it comes to gorgeous special effects, it's hard to top the visual feast that is Blade Runner 2049 thanks in no small part to its use of modern miniatures. Shout outs to uh, George Lucas, I guess. Yeah, because he did use them in episode one. He um, did use them in episode one. You happy? <laughs> <laughs> Director Denis Villeneuve delivered a masterclass in sci-fi filmmaking. And while it may have underperformed at the box office, the people who did go see 2049 aren't gonna forget it anytime soon. There are impressive effects from start to finish, like the incredible hologram love scene and a digital recreation of Sean Young that blows Grand Moff Tarkin out of the airlock. Wait, what? You may fire when ready. But the most striking thing about 2049 is its innovative use of one of the oldest FX techniques around, miniatures. Now, if you've seen our Star Wars video on VFX, you know where we're going with this. To create the future LA skyline in the original Blade Runner, FX legend Douglas Trumbull filled entire rooms with massive models made of brass and hacked together parts from commercial model kits. For 2049, Villeneuve hired Weta Workshop to recreate the same miniature magic with state-of-the-art techniques like computer modeling and 3D printing. But despite all the high-tech help, the soul of model making is still in the tiny meticulous details. Every window and fire escape on the 37 buildings around the LAPD headquarters was painstakingly placed by hand, just like the decayed wreckage around the trash mesa, and the monolithic masterpiece of Wallace Tower, which required a huge model to portray the two-mile-tall building at 1 600th the scale. That measurement there is a human. It's going to be a very tiny scale to work at. By using models instead of pure CG, Weta was able to capture the flaws of filming real objects in real space. It has all of the inherent flaws of filming something. Real surfaces illuminated with real light with all the issues of tiny specular reflections. It's a lot of effort, but those imperfections are what sells the illusion that these relatively tiny models exist as massive skyscrapers on the screen. If you need a craggy-faced rock monster for your superheroes to punch, standard Hollywood procedure is to slap some reflective dots on a B-list actor's face and call it a day. We all know Victor Von Doom was a f***ing travesty. F*** off, Steppenwolf. Yeah. It's the name of a band, isn't it? Yes. F*** right off. But with the right performer and requisite expertise, some studios use mocap to create living, breathing characters out of nothing but pixels. The world found upon faith and understanding. But a digital brought an old animation technique called rotoscoping into the modern age with their groundbreaking work on Gollum and Lord of the Rings. They were among the first effects houses to use motion capture technology to transfer an actor's real life performance to their CGI counterpart. And judging from their work on the Planet of the Apes reboot series, they're still number one in the game. I mean, just look at the way Caesar goddamn talks. My wife. That revolutionary ape might only exist on a hard drive in New Zealand, but in that movie, that's really Andy Serkis' performance you're seeing. He's not just doing the voice, he's physically there, on set, interacting with his fellow actors, not to mention acting like a fucking monkey. You're not just representing the character, you are the character for real. Andy Serkis is an incredible actor. He has such an understanding of Caesar from the inside. And over the course of their Apes trilogy, Weta constantly improved their techniques and technology, like introducing infrared sensors to capture performances on outdoor location shoots, 
far from the controlled lighting of a traditional mocap studio. They came up with the technique for Dawn of the Planet of the Apes in 2014. And when war broke out last year, they had enough confidence in the tech to bring the apes even further into the wilderness. War didn't have a huge breakthrough, but that's okay. VFX is an iterative field built on what came before. And the film is the crowning achievement in Oweta's long quest to make you empathize with a damn dirty CGI ape. Our next entry comes from everybody's favorite, Marvel Studios, whose effects work is always solid, but usually pretty unremarkable, at least until Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 and its subtle use of fractals. Nearly a dozen visual effects houses were involved in the finished product of Volume 2. One company exclusively worked on Rocket and Groot alone, another handled the perfect golden world of the Sovereign, while a third had the delicate task of de-aging Kurt Russell by about 30 years. And when it came to Ego Celestial form, it took three separate effects houses to bring the living planet to life. Usually the only math involved with an MCU release is how many solid gold boats the execs will be able to buy from the profits, but lately they've been experimenting with fractals, thank f They require about three years of college to explain in full, but in the most simple terms, a fractal uses a mathematical formula to create an intricate, interesting design. It's like pottery made from algorithms. The more you zoom in, the more complex it gets, all the way until infinity. Think Ant-Man shrinking in the last sequence of the movie. It's a hard concept to wrap your brain around, and it's even harder to incorporate into a big blockbuster movie. Age of Ultron used fractals to represent abstract information in a lot of the Jarvis scenes, and Doctor Strange incorporated them into its trippy multiverse segment. I didn't really get to see the fractals on Showcase in my airplane viewing of Doctor Strange, but trust me, they're there, and they're beautiful. But Volume 2 presented the unique challenge of building them into solid architecture. The thing is, fractals are chaotic by nature. They're literally used to graft processes in chaos theory. <laughs> See, here I'm now by myself uh, uh, talking to myself. That's, that's chaos theory. But you need structure to create plausible environments like Ego's palace and his underground caverns. Not to mention the insides of Kurt Russell's skull, which I don't know about you, but I've been dying to see. So Weta Digital came up with a method called the plague using computers to grow coral-like fractal structures all over Ego's domain. It takes a lot of work to build a CGI world, especially one made out of math homework, and it's even harder when you're dealing with three separate effects companies, each in a different time zone, with completely different software and workflows. But the end result is one of the most awesome effects we've ever seen in 2017. You people have issues. Well, of course I have issues. <laughs> That's my freaking father! Now, as impressive as Ego was, we still have a soft spot for the real stuff. That's why we're going to close out our retrospective with some practical magic. Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk is one of the most stunning war movies ever seen on film. From the cinematography to the sound design, it's crafted to make you feel like you're actually living through the massive military evacuation. And since the Dark Knight director is a stickler for realism, he used actual World War II vehicles and equipment to maintain that immersion. We really focused on that as being one of the most important aspects of the film, putting the audience in that scene. He shot the vast majority of the dogfight scenes with three real Supermarine Spitfire planes. For context, there are only 54 airworthy Spitfires left in the whole world. But the plane that won the Battle of Britain has stood the test of time. Nolan's planes were able to twist, roll, and dive like it's 1940, all with a 50-pound IMAX camera attached to the wing. No one has ever put an IMAX camera on a fixed wing and done air-to-air -air at 200 miles an hour. Make it look like it's shot on a GoPro, but with the quality of an IMAX camera. Speaking of mean machines, the final entry on our list is Baby Driver, one of my favorite movies of the year, despite Kevin Spacey's appearance. <sighs> Director Edgar Wright put his actors through intense driving training so they could pull off the insane stunts and intricate maneuvers worthy of Hollywood's greatest car chases. Of course, there were plenty of stunt drivers involved as well, but either way, most of the action is real. 
Wright kept the green screen and stunt rigs to a bare minimum in order to capture the authentic vibe of classic chase scenes like Bullet and The French Connection. All to the dopest soundtrack I've ever heard in a movie and synced up to it, so that's bonus points for you, Mr. Wright. The action isn't as bombastic as your average Fast and the Furious movie, but somehow a tight 180 turn in an alley is more thrilling than a dozen cars just falling out of an airplane. That's because we have an easier time connecting when we can see the actors actually driving the cars. There are real stunts putting real people in real danger and it just pumps your adrenaline up. It immerses you in a movie more than a thousand computer animated crashes ever could. I wanted people to watch the movie and really feel the car chases like they're living vicariously through Ansel's character. Visual effects have come a long way over the years and 2017 saw some of the most impressive digital feats ever committed to film. But as our last two entries have shown, no matter how fancy computer graphics can get, sometimes your best bet is to keep it real. Thank you for watching everyone. Looking back at my 2017, I've learned how to properly say the word Jumanji and I'm well aware of the amazing miniatures used in the Star Wars prequels. Thank you for that. My question for you though is how was your 2017 and what are you looking forward to us covering this year? Let us know in the comments. As always, please subscribe to Nellis Nerd and have yourself a great 2018.